Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the online screening of the film, Life is Wonderful, Mandela's Unsung Heroes. We'd like to welcome all of you who are joining us from different parts of the world. We know that we have people in, in the UK where it's 6 p.m., people in South Africa and the rest of Central Africa where it's 7 p.m. in the evening. And we also have people joining us as far as the United States where it is 1 p.m. in New York. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us in what is going to be um, an exciting uh, reflection on where South Africa comes from and where South Africa is at the moment. My name is Pumela Salela and I'm the UK country representative for Brand South Africa. Our role really as Brand South Africa is to position South Africa as a globally competitive nation. We are also here to create awareness about South Africa. We are also here to encourage collaborations, whether it's through investments, whether it's through the arts or culture, anything that can allow us to drive the prosperity of our country. So you can see us as the representatives that are here to really position South Africa as a globally competitive nation, which we are. Our role is to also rally the, what we call global South Africans. These are the South Africans that are spread throughout the world. And some of you have been pivotal in terms of inviting other people to join the Zoom because we rely on you to carry the flag and fly the flag about South Africa. Those of you who are not South African, you are equally welcome because we regard you as friends of South Africa and we also rely on the partnerships with yourselves to tell the world about South Africa and what South Africa has to offer. Thank you for joining. We have um, a, a program lined up that encompasses, um, first of all, you know, a moment of silence for those who have departed us. Uh, and then we are going to have um, this, the screening of the film itself. Thereafter, it will be followed by a discussion between um, our discussants, um, Sir Nicholas Stadlin, who's the maker of the film, uh, Dr. Elino Susulu, and uh, Mr. John Battersby. We will then be followed by, you know, reflections from young voices, young people who are going to share their perceptions and reflections after having watched the film. After that, we will allow you as the audience, as our esteemed audience, to ask questions to the panelists in the form of Sir Nicholas Stadlin and Ma Elino Sisulu. But first, let me also indicate that Today is about honoring Dennis Goldberg. Dennis Goldberg is the first man that you're going to see in this film when uh, it starts. He, he passed on on the 29th of April, and please allow me to tell you a bit about him. So Dennis Goldberg, which is, as I've said, the first person you're going to see, his name is Dennis Theodore Goldberg. He was born on the 11th of April, 1933, and he passed on on the 29th of April, 2020. He was a South African social campaigner who was active in the struggle against apartheid. He was accused number three in the Rivonia trial alongside the better known Nelson Mandela and Walter Sisulu. Hence it is significant that we have the Sisulu family here. And Dennis Goldberg was the youngest of the defendants and he was imprisoned for 22 years along with other key members of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And after his release in 1985, he, was, uh, he continued to campaign against apartheid from his base in London with his family until the apartheid system was fully abolished in the 1994 election. And then he returned to South Africa in 2002 and founded the nonprofit Dennis Goldberg Legacy Foundation Trust in 2015. He was diagnosed with lung cancer in July 2019 and died in Cape Town on the 29th of April 2020. And um, 
when he, in, in 1950, when he was age 16, Dennis Goldberg began his studies in civil engineering in the University of Cape Town. I'm sure there are some alumni from the University of Cape Town joining us here. And in his final year, he met Esme Bordenstein, who, who came from a family of, active, of activists in the Communist Party, and they married in January 1954. Their daughter, Hillary, was born in 1955, and their son, David, in 1957. So we wanted to hold the screening during the month of Mandela, which is July. Nelson Mandela was born on the 18th of July. We, ha uh, he, uh, we have uh, Dennis Goldberg, who was one of the, uh, you know, co uh, defendants, and he was he he passed on in April. So we thought it is it is significant that in this month of Nelson Mandela's birth, we honor. Dennis Goldberg, whilst we recognize the role that Nelson Mandela played in the struggle against apartheid on his birthday month. What I'm going to ask is that we start by having a moment of silence, one in recognition of Dennis Goldberg, and secondly, in recognition of Ambassador Zinzi Mandela, who recently left us this week. We will have a tribute uh, on, the, on, uh, on, 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 Zinzi Mand on Ambassador Zinzi Mandela, uh, which will be held by um, Ms. Cindy Swachabalala, uh, who is the president of the Circle of Global Business Women. And may I ask that we start by the moment of silence. May their souls rest in peace. Yes. May I ask that Miss um, Cindy Swachabalala, who's the president of the Circle of Global Business Women, gives us the tribute. Miss Cindy Swachabalala is the president of the of the Circle of Global Business Women. She has qualifications in accounting, human resources management corporate governance and a strategic leadership program from Gibbs. She's currently studying towards an MBA qualification and she's a former executive of the First National Bank, Land Bank, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development in KwaZulu-Natal Province and Edison Power Group. And she's an ambassador and advisory board member for the African Utility uh, Week and a board member of and director for Edison Power Group. She has held top executive positions in these institutions, driving strategy and transformation with an executive experience of more than 20 years. Um, over to you, Ms. Cindy Swachabalala. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Your Excellencies, uh, it's really indeed a quite honor for us as the Circle of Global Business Women to give a tribute to a powerful human being, a powerful spirit, the former ambassador, Zinzi Swanobu Mandela. And um, one thing that was striking about um, Ms. Zinzi um, she was a powerful human being. The death of the struggle icon, definitely she was a striker icon. And I'll qualify that when I actually talk in my speech. The death of the struggle icon caught us, you know, most of us globally by surprise because we're expecting to actually, you know, share the international uh, and Nelson Mandela's day with her but unfortunately we received the news um, prior to the International Women's Day, um, sorry, International um, Nelson Mandela Day. Uh, one thing that it was so exciting, Mrs. Elena Sisulu, is that Ambassador Sisulu in Greece, um, she actually went and graced an occasion where today in Greece there is Nelson Mandela Street. There is also Nelson Mandela uh, 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 home in Greece for the International uh, 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 Day for Tata Madiba. We are grateful for that as South Africa, as the community globally, because that's a legacy that he has left behind. 
Zinzi rose to the international prominence in 1985 when she read a letter in a mass gathering that was broadcast throughout the world on behalf of Dada Madiba, rejecting P.W. Bothe's conditional offer to release him. The rally was initially meant to honor um, our Archbishop Desmond Tutu Peace Prize Award. Zinzi told the Peg Jabulani Amphitheater that her mother, Nomzamo Winfred Mandela, could not deliver the message because she was banned. And she was not allowed to meet with more than one person at a time, and that could not be quoted. Now, this is something very powerful about Sis Zinzi. Sis Zinzi decided to actually support her parents and not question them in the struggle but she was there for them all the time and making sure that they deliver the mandate of releasing all of us in South Africa. She was a conduit between Tata Madiba in, the, in jail and Mama. And the crowd greeted the 24-year-old at Jablani Amphitheater with a wild applause. I mean, you'd imagine a 24-year-old reading a statement on behalf of a father. That is what you're talking about, a gentle giant, somebody that has, somebody that was big inside. And she carried on stage and she entered and the packed on the Javlan Amphitheater and later slipped into the stadium, almost unnoticed in the singing of freedom songs, claiming her, the father and of the African National Congress. And since he was born from the, Tribal icons that never changed uh, who she was, even till today, until her last breath in life. Zinzi was actually respecting everybody and respecting even young people. That's who she was. And what really struck most about Sis Zinzi is that. She went on on the outlet and the memories of her father. And what she spoke about, she spoke about things that worried her a lot during the time where um, they had to change schools because they were not allowed to actually go to any other school. But that never made her to deter, to support her parents. And I still remember there was a video that was actually shared where she actually said that they ended up trans being transferred to go to Swaziland. And that was powerful for me because they kept on fighting with her sister, Sis Zenani and Mandela as well to make sure that the light that the father and the mother has started in the family, but for South Africa as a community and for us as global community today, because we are humbled by the legacy that the parents have left, and the children that have supported them. And Zinzi was um, ambassador um, of South Africa in Denmark when she actually left. And also at the same time, there's one thing that people didn't know. Zinzi liked writing poems. You know, people that write poems, they're highly <laughs> spiritual people. That's one thing that was outstanding about her. And I was also blessed as well to actually work very closely with her. My first project was the launch of Mama's book in Durban. That was really exciting for me because I saw Zinzi, who she was, and working very closely with her. And the second um, project was Mama's funeral. I saw her when people coming through the house, people, some of them, they were crying, but she was there to actually say, no, it's fine, it's okay. This is the big heart that I'm talking about. You'd imagine you've lost your mother. Some people walk in crying, but you're the one that says, it's okay, she is resting now. That was so powerful for me. And she has left a very good resemblance of what a woman of character and a woman of dignity is, despite of the struggles that she has actually fought um, in her life as a struggle icon. 
and she has never forgotten where she comes from. And Sisinzi is a humble human being and highly spiritual. And she identified her own voice and she honed on onto it. And she had a perfect soul. And what we thank Sisinzi for, she was full of light. And I loved her inner being. And Sisinzi, we will remember you as many things. But the most important thing is the circle of global business women and the global community and South Africans will remember you as a fearless fighter, a sensitive soul, a shiro win. Long live the spirit of Zinzi Mandela, long live. May we continue to be inspired by her. This is my tribute to a dominator um, spirit. Um, thank you very much, program director, for the tribute that we have made to Sizinzi. And remember that uh, Sizinzi Son Mandela has not died. She has multiplied through us. We are now the Zinzi Mandela of this world. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cindy Chabalala, for calling us to take the baton for what Ambassador Zinzi Mandela stood for. Thank you to those who've joined us. The numbers have increased. Uh, we are grateful to have so many people who are joining us. Uh, today, we are really celebrating the lives of heroes uh, through the, the film that we're going to screen, which is called Life is Wonderful, Mandela's Unsung Heroes. Life is Wonderful, Mandela's Unsung Heroes is an award-winning documentary celebrating the centenary of Nelson Mandela's birth with a look back at the Rivonial trial, which led to Mandela's imprisonment. Sir Nicholas Stadlin in this film interviews many of those involved at the time, including three of Nelson Mandela's co-defendants and three of the defense lawyers, and tells the inspiring story of their courage, their self-sacrifice, their integrity, and their commitment. And this film explores the legacy of the trial in legal history. And uh, to link the legal part of the film, let me tell you a bit about Sir Nicholas Stadlin himself, who's a filmmaker. Sir Nicholas Stadlin is a retired English High Court judge. He's a former president of the Cambridge Union and Barrister of the Year for his successful defense of the Bank of England in the BCCI litigation, in which his opening speech of 119 days was the longest in English legal history. So you see the legal connection between the filmmaker himself and the film. And Sir Nick, who produced this film, um, he's, he's narrated the film. And he's actually, in, two, in 2006 and 2007, he did a, a groundbreaking series of one hour podcast interviews for The Guardian with leading political figures around the world, including Archbishop Tutu and F.W. de Klerk. So there's a lot that is stored in Sir Nicholas Stadlin's bank uh, in the form of archiving the history of um, our country. And this film actually uh, was selected by the Alderberg Film Festival in 2019 and in 2020, the Vancouver uh, film Festival uh, and, the, and the Sydney SA film, film Festival asked for it to be submitted. Sir Nicholas Stadlin is a trustee of Help to Read, which supports one-to-one uh, -one assistance for learners uh, with reading difficulties in South Africa. I know that we have board members of Help to Read who are also joining us here, who've never had the opportunity to see the film. We welcome you. Uh, Sir Nicholas Stedlin with Joel Joffe, with Lord Joel Joffe and Ben Valentin to see, set up a charity which is called Life is Wonderful in order to educate and inspire young 
young people in the history of anti-apartheid struggle and the charity is helping to raise money to support the showing of the film at high schools in South Africa. So we ask that even beyond this film, uh, that you lend a hand in ensuring that this film reaches more and more young people, in fact, young and old across South Africa, because this is a story to be told uh, as, it, as it is a beautiful story of collaboration, particularly across races in this time when we have um, racial issues that are dominating the world. So this film can actually serve as a unifier uh, so that people can get to understand that it's about the human being and not the color of your skin to be able to make a change. It takes a human being, it takes your soul, it takes your commitment, it takes your dedication to be able to stand for what is right and make a difference um, in life. The second um, discussant is Mr. John Buttersby. Mr. John Buttersby is a non-executive director of the South African Chamber of Commerce in the UK, and he is an ambassador of the Dutu Foundation. He is also a trustee of the charity Life is Wonderful, along with Sir Nick Stadlin and Ben Valentin QC. John has walked the walk with Nelson Mandela in his lifetime, and he has documented some of Nelson Mandela's experiences, some of Nelson Mandela's um, memories, and, and, and in, in various publications. I mean, John has written articles and co-authored books on Nelson Mandela. Some of the articles are What Made Mandela Great, and uh, it was shown in, the, in, in CNN, um, Mandela's legacy, and 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 he's also and he's also part and chair of the Kenon Collins uh, Educational and Legal Trust. So there's a theme of legal. There's a theme of education that is taking place today. Our third uh, panelist is Dr. Elino Sisulu. We are going to call him Ma Elino. Um, everyone under. 25. Only everyone under 25 is allowed to call her ma. Uh, if you're older than that, um, you will call her differently. She is Dr. Elino Sisulu. She's Zimbabwean born and a South African writer and human rights activist. Dr. Elino Sisulu combines training in history, English literature, development studies, and feminist theory from institutions in Zimbabwe, Senegal, and the Netherlands. She's the author of an award-winning children's book, which is called The Day Gogo Went to Vote. And her biography on her parents-in-law, Walter and Bettina Sisulu, called In Our Lifetime, secured her the prestigious 2003 Noma Award for Publishing in Africa. Dr. Elino Sisulu's involvement in book promotion and literary development efforts for many years has culminated in her work with the Puku Children's Festival, a children's literature foundation. She's active in arts and literary organizations and is a board member of the National Arts Festival. She, in April 2019, was awarded an honorary PhD in recognition of her interdisciplinary work and commitment to social change. Dr. Elina Susulu has worked with many human rights organizations, including Crisis Action, which is an international human rights uh, organization to which she consulted from 2019 until 2020. As indicated, ladies and gentlemen, the format of our program today is that we're going to have the, the panelists having a discussion and a conversation amongst themselves, and then they will be followed by young people because it's important that we balance the voices of the old and the young and we see the film through the lens of young people as well. So we have our panelists of respondents which are in the form of Mataba Motiane uh, who works at the US consulate in Johannesburg managing the Fulbright programs in higher education research and development grants and prior, and prior to, the, uh, to that, she worked in the think tank and research industry as a researcher that's involved in international relations. We also have Colossan Dombini, who's an aspiring scholar in the field of human geography 
interested in nature conservation, mining and land reform in sub-Saharan Africa. And she's a Canon Collins Scholar and was the 2019 Scholar Scholar recipient with an award given by the alumni for, the, for, for her being an exceptional person that embodies and meaningfully contributing to the trust, open and just society. We also have Danala Olodapo as a young person who's just graduated from the Schwarzam Scholar and she's, a, she's, a, a master, she's got a master's in global affairs from Tsinghua University. She sits in the UK, uh, I Will Fund Leadership Board and she influences how investment is allocated to increase UK social action. We also have Lishoho Nolo, Nolo Piri Rutledge and uh, she was born and raised in Johannesburg in South Africa in Alexander Township and she finished her undergraduate degree in finance at UCT and her postgraduate degree at Goldsmith University in international relations in London. So you can see we have uh, young people who are who are full of energy, who are intelligent, who are, um, you know, who are going to be reflecting on this film. But without further ado, let us show the film and thereafter there will be a conversation uh, which will be led by uh, John Buttersby, whom I've introduced um, between the panelists that we have, which is my Elino Sisulu and Sir Nicholas Adlen himself. So over to the film. Freedom for ourselves and our family, the right to vote and equality under the law, all things we have come to expect on our road through life. But what if these fundamental human rights were denied us by a draconian regime? Would we have the courage to stand up and defend them or would we look the other way? And what if it wasn't our freedoms being denied, but those of other people? Would we stand up and be counted even if doing so risked torture, life in prison, and possibly even death. We really expected death sentences. And when you look at the gallows together, there's a bond. It can never be broken, only by death. Give me this bit of information, or you're going to hang. They said, no, our, our, our husbands were hanged this morning in Pretoria. And we wanted to, to know how we could get the bodies. In 1963, Nelson Mandela went on trial for his life for plotting to overthrow the apartheid regime in South Africa. When he finished and sat down, there was a long silence in the court because of the clear challenge to the judge, hang me if you dare. The trial would capture the attention of the world and alter the course of history. But Mandela did not act alone. The trial and the events surrounding it would involve acts of exceptional courage on the part of the other defendants, along with fearlessness and brilliance on the part of their lawyers. This is their story. Mandela! <laughs> Uh, I must start by just, you know, reading some of your comments. I see everybody is saying thank you. Uh, people are saying uh, such wonderful acts of generosity. Uh, Sir Nicholas Staden, I think we should all clap virtually for you in this moment. Well done. Well done on such great work and capturing the journey that led us to the freedom that we have today in South Africa. And may I say, lest we forget, lest we forget. There are a number of thank yous. 
we will come back to the questions that you are laying, but I think the, the, the questions um, are generally, firstly, Sir Nicholas Dudley, that people are saying that they want to assist Life is Wonderful, the charity. They want to assist you in the work that you are doing so that this form reaches more and more people. I think that's the first um, common factor that I'm picking up. And the second um, uh, is that they would like to ensure that the form reaches even beyond schools, but organizations, workplaces, and uh, in, particularly in this time that we are having issues with Black Lives Matter and, um, and a, a seemingly um, non-understanding of the racial issues between uh, parties. Those of you who were here earlier on, I, I indicated that when you want to do good, it's not about color, it's about your soul, it's about your values, it's about your integrity, it's about your commitment to doing what's good in your lifetime. These people uh, sacrifice their lifetime. I remember I had the opportunity to uh, sit with um, with um, Lord Joel Joffe, with uh, George Bezos, with Dennis Goldberg, with Baba Andrew Langeni, when they were being given the freedom of the city of London. And I sat with Dennis uh, Goldberg and I said to him, Tata, um, you know, uh, what do you think of South Africa um, at this current moment? And he was so happy, he was so positive. He said to me, we have achieved what we strive for. So you see, we may be looking at the country and, and, and thinking of it from a negative point of view, but these men who are so selfless actually are still very happy that their mission was accomplished. And I say to the South Africans here, it is in our hands, as Nelson Mandela has once said. And to the friends of South Africa who are joining us, please continue to help us in the efforts that um, you know we have as a country in order to be able to build the country and create awareness about our history so that we can have direction for our future. Without further ado, allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to recognize um, a special guest that we have in our audience, and that is Ubaba Umex Vuisile Sosulu. Uh, he is the son to Walter Sisulu, who, are, who in the film was shown as having said the government is the one that should be on trial and not him. And then the rest of the, of the accused followed suit with that saying that let it be the trial of the government and not themselves. Um, Ubaba Abu Max Vuisile Susun was born on the 23rd of August in 1945, and he is a South African politician who was a speaker in the National Assembly of South Africa uh, from 2009 to 2014. As indicated, he is the son of the late Walter Sisulu and Albertina Sisulu, and we are pleased that we have his uh, wife who is joining us as a panelist, Uma Elino Sisulu. We are very grateful to the role that the Sisulu family has played in the history of the struggle in South Africa. Thank you very much. So what we're going to do now is that we are going to hand over to John Battersby to have a conversation with St. Nicholas Dudlin, to have a conversation with Ma Elino Sisulu. Please continue to ask your questions as I'm capturing them on the side and your comments. We really appreciate them. Then there will be a time for young people, to uh, four young people that we have lined up to reflect on this form. After the young people have, um, have shared their perceptions and thoughts on the form, we are going to have a session where we answer your questions. Most of the questions that you have, you have posed, I've captured them and I will be highlighting some of them, but within the allocated time. If for any reason, uh, your question has not been answered, we'll make sure that you get an email response. Um, this is uh, Sir Nicholas Statlin's baby, and he really puts all his time in nurturing this baby and ensuring that all matters that relate to this are attended to. Thank you very much. Over to you, John. 
Thank you very much, uh, Pamela, and, um, and, and welcome to everybody who's joined us for this uh, um, historic uh, occasion. Historic because, um, as Pamela has said, and she's done a great job interviewing um, Ma Eleanor Sisulu and her husband, Max Sisulu, um, the Sisulu family is larger than life in the South African struggle. Um, in addition to Walter Sisulu, um, his late wife, Albertina Sisulu, was uh, a huge figure, a uh, leadership figure in the anti-apartheid movement in her own right. And of course, the late Zwilaki Sisulu was also uh, a giant in the struggle. So we really are, and of course, um, um, Lindiwe Sisulu is today a minister in the government of uh, President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa. So it's an extraordinary family, and Eleanor, we are, we are extremely grateful um, to, to you uh, to join us today as a representative of this family. Um, it is also, of course, a, a great privilege to have with us Sir Nick Stadlin, um, who uh, is the creator uh, of this film uh, in every sense, uh, in, in terms of uh, both director, producer, and, uh, and, and, and everything else. And we'll be hearing from him shortly. Um, I'd like to give the first word uh, to, I, I would also just like to say that there were two people who Nelson Mandela repeatedly said, um, he said it publicly, he said in interviews that I did with him, there were two people in his life with whom, without whom he would not have been able to achieve what he achieved in terms of his contribution towards the liberation of South Africa. And the one was Bram Fischer, who you've seen um, in this film, and the other was Walter Sisulu, who gave up his own uh, leadership position from the days of the uh, from the days of the, uh, the the militant youth league of the ANC in the late 1940s. He recognised the leadership qualities of Nelson Mandela, and he was the man behind Nelson Mandela, always advising, always giving of himself to promote the leader of the future. So it is really a pleasure. I'm going to give you the first word, Eleanor, uh, just to give us your off-the-cuff reaction to what you've seen today. Um, yes, it was a, like a trip down memory lane because I went through all these wonderful and amazing stories, heartbreaking stories as well, while I was writing the book about Walter and Albertina Sisulu. And what struck me, as watching the film was sadness because so many, so many of the people are gone. Um, we've just recently lost Dennis. So Andrew Mlangeni, who is 92 now, is the last re remaining Ravonia trialist. And a lot of the other people that I, you know, were interviewed are no longer with us. And so there's this feeling that time has rushed on and history is not being captured. And I must congratulate uh, Nick for capturing this story and uh, retelling it through a documentary, which is very compelling. And I saw a lot of the comments people were making that this should be our history that's not being told, it should be in the schools. And I was thinking of the students when they talked about a decolonized education, that this is the kind of thing that they were, they were thinking of. And so one of the challenges which we must address and maybe in a different platform is the challenge of how to, how not to lose history. Um, you know, I, we have South Af African History Online, which I'm sure many of you may have heard of, is actually in financial trouble. And they've been a wonderful resource for keeping stories of so many people that otherwise would not be captured. So uh, we, and I've been involved in helping others to do biographies of struggle figures. One I should mention is Jonas Guangwa. And we are really struggling to get these projects done. And I know Nick uh, did a lot of hard work. I mean, a lot of the work on a project like this is the fundraising as much as actually doing, uh, doing the actual work. So that's something that uh, yeah, is, 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 is something really worries me about that, that we, we actually losing these stories very quickly. And I'm glad that Nick has captured this one. Thanks uh, very much, Eleanor. 
Um, Nick, if we can come to you, and it's a challenge because um, um, I'm not sure where you are on this massive screen of hundreds of people, but I know you're there. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, rely on, on, on your voice, perhaps without being able to see you. Um, the obvious question that people ask um, once they have kind of gathered themselves after watching this film, and I have to say that I've seen it about 15 times, but I haven't seen it for more than a year because we show, um, um, I, I was at a lot of the showings during the Nelson Mandela um, Centenary Exhibition in 2018. And um, I'm always amazed how I think, oh, well, look, I've seen the film 12 times, so I'll sit down and I'll watch it again. And I end up, without fail, um, shedding tears. It, it, is so, it is such an emotional experience through um, that part of our history that it seems to grab one um, every time. But the question I think that a lot of people will be asking, Nick, is how does a retired um, um, uh, English High Court judge uh, come to become so immersed in South Africa's history um, as to make a film like this? Could you briefly tell us how you got there? Well, there's a long-term uh, answer and a short-term answer. The long-term answer is that when I was 17, I was a working as a busboy, which is a subwaiter in uh, a restaurant in New York when Martin Luther King was shot. And I just got on a Greyhound bus and went down to Memphis uh, and took part in a vigil there. And from there I hitchhiked to Atlanta where the funeral was. And in the course of that lift, uh, I encountered racism red in tooth and claw. The man pulled out a gun from his glove compartment and said, this is for any outside agitator. Uh, or any N-word loving outside agitator that I come across. And I had chucked in the back of the car a placard saying Atlanta, where I was hitchhiking, uh, which was the back of a placard I'd been holding at the vigil saying honor Martin Luther King. And for the next four and a half hours, I wondered which way up I'd left the placard. The short term answer is that I by chance was in Cape Town after I took early retirement in December 2013, in the week between Nelson Mandela's memorial service and his funeral. And there was wall-to-wall -wall coverage, particularly of the Rivonia trial. And I got in touch with Dennis Goldberg through the, the reporter who'd interviewed him for the Cape Times. And not thinking that she would give me his address uh, or that if she did that Dennis would uh, have anything to do with me, I said, you don't know me, I'm uh, Nick Stadler, I'm a retired in short high court judge. Could I come and talk to you about the Rivonia trial? And Dennis, being the Dennis I subsequently came to know and love, said, come and spend the day in Hout Bay, which I did with my wife, Frances, and it changed my life because through Dennis, I discovered that there were still alive three co-defendants of Nelson Mandela, Andrew Malingeni, Cathy Cathrada, and Dennis, and three members of the legal defense team, Joel Joffe, the attorney, Dennis Cooney, and George Bezos. And I had never heard any of these names, and Still less had I heard the name of Bram Fisher. So I read up, I got all the books, uh, the Virgin Atlantic plane nearly crashed, and I asked around back in London, and none of my, very few of my friends and colleagues in the law or journalism knew it, uh, about any of these names, let alone these stories. And what hit me with such power, um, and this was 2014, was that this was the beginning, or certainly, it had been, uh, it, it was early days of the real disillusionment among young black people in the townships against what they saw as a corrupt system, cronyism, corruption. And none of these people, or very few of these people, as I subsequently discovered as I took the film all around South Africa, knew these names or knew these stories. And I was so moved and inspired by these stories, I thought, well, if I'm inspired to make a film about them, why wouldn't a young South African be moved to ask themselves if these ordinary people had such reserves of courage, integrity, self-sacrifice, and commitment to ending apartheid, if they could literally change apartheid, what can I do to make my society, my country better? And it's really this sense of inspiration, which I think is crucial in the current South Africa to re-engaging young people and making them realize that their political freedoms have, were won by people of gigantic moral stature. Uh, and that 
if they could do it 25 years ago, 50 years ago, then these young people can do it today. And I suppose the two messages of the film are, you don't have to be a once in a lifetime, charismatic, world admired leader like Nelson Mandela to change the world. You can be an architect like Rusty Bernstein or an engineer like Dennis Goldberg or a golf fanatic like Andrew Mullingeni. And the second, to use Andrew Mullingeni's words when he got a, um, an honorary doctorate at the University of South Africa, we were a multiracial band of comrades fighting for a non-racial society. And that is absolutely at the heart of what drove Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, and all the others. And it's absolutely critical because in the current South Africa, there is the demon of incipient racism in all directions, white against black, black against white, black against Indian, and vice versa. And that, not in, not in their name, is what this film is saying. Andrew and Dennis, when you, Andrew at the end of the film says, when you see the things going on in the country today, Dennis, it makes your heart to bleed. And it did make their hearts bleed. And they were very loyal members of the ANC, but throughout that, the, uh, that period, they made their representations internally inside the ANC, and eventually they went public. And the other thing I say is this, that um, when we had the launch two years ago, I had a feeling that this film had a resonance uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement. And boy, is that now the case in spades, as we've seen with a lot of the messages that have been coming through during the film. There is a resonance between what, what, happens, what happened in South Africa and in the Deep South in the United States. Mandela's, if needs be, I'm prepared to die speech in April 64 was eight months after Martin Luther King's I have a dream speech that one day my children would be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. And we thought that one led eventually to the end of apartheid and one led to the end of segregation in the deep south. But as we've been seeing in the last year, there's a lot of work still to be done. Nick, thank you very much. Um, Eleanor, did you want to say something at that point? I, I enjoyed Nick's story and I think making the connections with the civil rights movement going right back and to the current situation. I think my main thing is that uh, the, the challenge is how do we prevent a generational break? How do we ensure intergenerational transfer of, of knowledge? I watched the, an, another Bram Fischer film by a Dutch journalist and he uh, it was done during a uh, uh, Dutch uh, South Africa celebration, looking back at the Dutch anti-apartheid movement. And there were a lot of young people from the township called Bramfisherville, or the settlement called Bramfisherville. And they were so bowled over. I mean, they, were, they said, we live in this place, but we know nothing about this man after whom the film is made. So there, there is that really urgent task to ensure that the histories of people continue. And I'm really worried that with all the COVID focus and the economic fallout of the COVID um, pandemic, that there won't be, that the little resources that were going towards historical knowledge are going to dwindle away and that it'll be, it'll be even more difficult to make wonderful work such as what Nick has done. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, Nick, I have to say you're an interviewer's dream because not only have you popped up on my screen, um, but you answered my first four questions. So <laughs> I'm going on to question number five now, which is you have shown this film, it's well over a hundred times now. I think it's about 50, 60 times in South Africa and likewise in the UK. And of course you've, you've shown it in the US as well. So you have been there on virtually all those occasions to, um, to, to, to absorb the reaction um, of audiences. Um, I'd like to ask you how, that, how, how the impact of your film has affected you and affected your life and, uh, and, 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 and what this has meant to you in terms of the kind of reactions that you've had to the film. With two exceptions, literally two exceptions, uh, the universal response has been very emotional, 
uh, on the part of veteran, struggle veterans who thought that they would take their stories with them to the grave, and on the part of young people who knew nothing about the stories, black and white. At one of the launches, there was a Afrikaner uh, entrepreneur, a businesswoman who, uh, you know, in her 30s, I'd say, uh, who was in tears and said, all during her childhood in South Africa, she had been made to feel that she was personally responsible for her child. And she didn't know, nobody told her that there were people like Bram Fischer, Joe Slavo, Dennis um, Goldberg, and so on. Um, and the other question that always emerged from teachers and parents was, when can our, and how can our children see this film? How can they, because they don't know this history. And I'm very pleased to say that the Ministry of Basic Education in Pretoria has agreed to show the film at every one of the 6,500 high schools in South Africa. And the charity which John and I and Lord Joel Joffe and Ben Valentin set up, called Life is Wonderful, a UK charity, uh, is trying to raise money to support that happening because uh, obviously with COVID and so on, funds in South Africa are, uh, in the government are limited. But I think education is absolutely crucial because young people need to be engaged. They need to feel that there is there are ideals which they can take on. And if there's one story that um, strikes me in this film, it is the passing of the baton. Joel Joffe said at one point that uh, Bram Fischer was his hero and is his hero. And he spent the rest of his life uh, trying to promote and, and, and retrieve the record and the name of what Bram Fischer did. And Joel Joffe in turn inspired me uh, to make this film. And many of the people that I've seen, young people, have, as young people normally are, responded with an open heart and said, wow, I didn't know these stories. What great people of integrity. What can I do? Thank you, Nick. Um, could you give us an idea of where you would like to take this film in terms of the aspirations for the future and what your plans are for the future? You, it, your film has been widely acknowledged. It's won, it's won awards, um, including at the Cape Town International documentary film festival and it's won a lot of praise um, and it's moved a lot of people um, how do you plan to mobilize that reaction and to take forward the message of the the values and and uh, uh, example of this uh, revenue generation uh, in two ways first of all by uh, trying to ensure that the film is shown after covid uh, uh, in schools not just in South Africa, but in the United States and also in the United Kingdom, because all three of those countries, our countries, uh, have got problems of race, as we've seen over the last few weeks. Um, and secondly, uh, by possibly making another film, which I am have, have started work on, but which has been interrupted by the uh, by the by, by the COVID, uh, and that is on a, a later phase of the struggle against apartheid, the Black Consciousness Movement, and Steve Biko. Thank you, Nick. Um, if I could ask a final question um, of you, Eleanor, and then I think we're going to be virtually time up, and that is you have twice told us that you, you worried about losing some of these incredibly inspiring stories of the um, generation past um, in terms of the liberation struggle. Do you have any um, ideas, uh, um, uh, apart from what Nick has already outlined um, in relation to his film, of how one can move forward and capture the, um, capture the values, the, the courage, the, in, uh, the integrity, uh, the ingenuity, the steadfastness of that generation so that it, so the baton can be passed to the generation that follows? How do we best do that? Well, I think supporting the, the institutions that do that work and ensuring that they survive, uh, life is wonderful is, as an institution is a one good uh, example. Uh, the Cannon Collins, Collins Trust, um, I saw Nicholas Wolpe on, the, on, the, on this call, the um, Lily's Leaf Farm, uh, South Africa History Online, 
I think is particularly important now because it's a digital project and um, and it's a it's a reference it's like a Wikipedia for South African history I think that so supporting those institutions that exist the other thing is getting our kids to read because you know Nick has captured this in film but a lot of it is in the books you know you think of the book written by uh, Rusty Bernstein by Hilda Bernstein as well. Uh, there's a lot of books covering uh, this period. Uh, the other thing is, I think for South Africans to campaign to have history as a compulsory subject in schools, mm. I think it's a very unfortunate thing that uh, South Africans have avoided history uh, because partly they want to avoid confrontation within within the classroom or within the schools and this this is something that we have to confront because uh we we never we never going to really truly be a rainbow nation without that uh, historical reckoning thank you uh, very, just very, briefly very much eleanor nick just two very quick points one is to pick up on lily's leaf and eleanor just mentioned that nick Wolpe. The director of the Lilies Leaf Trust Museum uh, is uh, in the audience. And that is a brilliant world class museum with brilliant uh, um, uh, exhibits, uh, highly, um, but very highbrow, expecting the best of uh, the visitors. And I urge everybody who hasn't been there to go there, but particularly to take their children there. The second thing is I don't want to let Max and um, Eleanor go without mentioning that Dennis Goldberg. Uh, told me that although he greatly admired Madiba, Nelson Mandela, he deeply loved Walter Sisulu. And I think that was so of many people. That's very, a very nice uh, um, um, anecdote um, on which to end, Nick. Um, I would just um, uh, like, to, uh, uh, like to now um, hand over to Pumela, who I think will chair the next session with the young people, and then we'll come back with Eleanor and Nick for the Q&A at the end. Over to you, Pamela. Thank you very much, John. Um, thank you once again, Sir Nicholas Stadlin, for playing your part in terms of capturing the history of South Africa in terms of where we come from so that it can lead us into the future. And Ma Elino Susulu, thank you for the passion that you have for education, for human rights, for development. We appreciate you. Um, John, thank you for chairing that uh, session. Uh, as I've indicated before, John is a seasoned journalist. There's no better person who could ever do this job better than him in terms of interviewing. And he has also written a number of books and a number of articles on Nelson Mandela. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you can agree with me that we have a high powered, um, you know, Panel, a set of panelists and uh, earlier on we also had uh, a high-powered woman in the form of Cindy Chabalala who gave a tribute to Ambassador Zinzi Mandela. Without further ado, um, Sir Nicholas Scotland uh, mentioned that young people need to be engaged and that young people must feel that there are ideals that they can take on into the future. So we have the voice of the young people represented here. Uh, and so we would like then to hear from you as young people. I've indicated we have Mataba Motiane, we have Polosa Ndombini, we have Danola Oladapo and Leso Honolo, also known as Nolo Piri Rutledge. So we have Colors already on the big screen. So please fire on, give us your reflections or further questions. I said, Nicholas Stadlin, some of the young people said they've got further questions for you. So we're going to allow them as well to then interact with you. And I'm just going to ask that Stuart unmute Sir Nicholas Stadlin because some of these questions will be particularly uh, targeted to you. Uh, Colossa. Thank you so much. Um, is my sound okay? Perfect. Um, yeah, it's, it was such an incredible film. I think um, I share what uh, John has said. I've watched the film once before. And you think the first time you've seen it, 
the shock sits deep in your heart and you think the second time it will be better, but it's not. And I think I'm remembering what Mama has, what Mama Eleanor has said that perhaps sometimes you try and shy away from having these conversations because there's deep pain. But I think there's something my supervisor once said to me that this pain or this anger must be the driving force to force us to change. And so I guess I, I, I want to reflect on that, that how do we take what we've seen in the film and it be a driving force? For example, one thing that stood out for me that Dennis said is that once you take off the veil, you can never put it back again. And it means to continue, you must tell yourself a lie every single day. And I think sadly, we continue to tell ourselves a lie every single day when we ignore the, the, the things that still need to be done to make sure that what they were fighting for is still something, a reality that is today. So the Black Lives Movement is a showing that people continue to tell themselves a lie every single day that things are fine, but we're still fighting fights that we thought were settled uh, 25 years ago. We're still having to have the same conversations again. And I think it's very important that a film like this reminds us or put, brings us a sense of urgency that we still need to have these conversations and we still have to have the same power and the same courage that these men and women had to fight for justice. I think also for me, what also stood out is that uh, something that one person said that white people also needed to be liberated. And I think for me, it came, it was an interesting remark because I think as a black person, when I see these films, there's a sense of this anger that things have not happened well. And so you think that there's one perpetrator to something, they, uh, people are perpetrators, but to realize that people are also victims of that indoctrination that you are better than another because of your skin color. And so we, there is a sense of compassion that you need to have that all of us are victims of that propaganda and we still need to do better. So I think those are my immediate reflections for now. I think there's another point I want to come back to. Mama Eleanor said that this film reminds her that we need to, this is what we talk about when we say we need a decolonized curriculum. And when she said that, I just was, I smiled. I was so excited because um, my first year at university was in 2015 at the start of the Roads Must Fall movement. And so my introduction to higher education has been in that atmosphere of questioning everything, questioning the education system, questioning value system, questioning my whole entire high school education. So I think just to also, I, I guess it was this intergenerational conversation to realize that that fight for decolonized education is still there. And I guess, yeah, to hear Mama Eleanor say that, I, it, it invigorated me more. And I know for me in high school, I didn't take geography because I remember we were taught the French Revolution and I could not relate to that history because it, it, I didn't know what I'm supposed to learn from it. It was not contextualizing, but now, I'm a master's student and I, my research is somewhere between politics, history and geography. And so this history is very important to me. I work on land reform. And I guess I want to say that this conversation is about political freedom, which is what we got. We have not gotten economic freedom. And this is where the conversation of land reform comes in. And so, yeah, I think for me, it would be interesting as we continue to the conversation to say, what have we not gotten? And, and what is moving the Banton forward going to look like? I think those are my immediate thoughts. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Kolosa. You already have comments coming on from the uh, participants. Uh, Nick Sherwood says, great words, Kolosa. And Tabi Sopi says, well articulated. So I can just relay those as a form of encouragement uh, that you have been heard. We have heard your voice. Thank you very much. Um, then let us have Mataba Mutiani. Over to you. What are your thoughts on the film? Or do you have questions for Sir Nicholas? Sure. Um, so with um without wanting to repeat a lot of what was already said, there are a few things that came to me that uh I thought were some real takeaways. Uh and the first two um 
were was the, was the first one is about coming to terms with uh, our un our unconscious bias. Um, so in the case of um, Advocate Bezos and um, and Bram Fisher, they both spoke so candidly and their stories were told so candidly about how they came to terms with their own con unconscious bias about um, other people and others and in, in this instance black people and I found that um, clarity and just um, vulnerability so refreshing and I think it's something that's so important in our countries and in the world right now as we're all currently facing um, continuing um, racial issues and, 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 and an outcry about Black Lives Matter, it's also very closely linked to having the ability to come to terms with your role in it, regardless of the fact that you may not have been an, a specifically an aggressor, you were not a policeman standing, beating people, yet your beliefs and the way you chose to respond to people in private um, uh, actually also reflects something that continues to be a problem in South Africa and throughout the world today. Um, secondly, I also wanted to say to my Eleanor about uh, South African History Online. This is definitely a resource that I used consistently throughout my time in university. And it would be a real shame to see uh, uh, institutions that are and organizations and websites in this instance that are able to to tell our stories and especially telling stories about people that we we don't that aren't really at the at the forefront of our imaginations our understandings of the apartheid anti-apartheid movement is really important for us and i certainly uh before watching this didn't have such a i i certainly didn't have a very um as clear a view of the roles uh, that, for instance, Bram Fisher played uh, in, 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 as a lawyer and throughout his life um, working for South Africans. So I think that those are really two important things. But then it also makes me think, lastly, about how much, um, and thinking about kind of the role that youth and how youth may see this film and have seen it, it really makes me think about the kind of trauma that our country has been through. Uh, and that even today, whether it's um, through racially related issues or other issues, our fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers are still suffering the trauma of this um, be across races. And it's, um, I mean, there are a few moments where I felt like choking up were actually those moments where I felt um, that the people I was watching on the show, on, on, the, on the film, were coming to terms with the fact that this was hugely traumatizing. Some of the things um, that the Dennis didn't even want to talk about really. And I could totally understand how much more, if he's feeling that way, how much more, how many more stories are there out there of South Africans, black and white, who's, who haven't been told. Um, and they're also still suffering the trauma of that and their families are. So I think beyond even just, um, uh, kind of saving information and ensuring that we're able to to read about these stories. I think there's still a lot of work to be done on reconciling our hearts about what actually happened and how do we move forward as a country, not in pain and out of anger, but out of wanting to make our country better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think what comes across in what you've just said is a message of healing, that we need to heal mm -hmm. as a nation for us to be able to move forward. And really, really, um, as in reflecting on the sacrifices that have been made by those before us, then we can be able to shape the future that we need uh, for our country. But we rely on you as young people, you know, to be the change that you want to see, to be the leaders of tomorrow. And we are actually grateful that in your spaces, even at the moment, you are playing that leadership role. You are never too young to be a leader. Uh, thank you so much. Now, we shall give an opportunity to Danola Oladapo for your reflections and your questions. 
Oh, thank you so much. Good evening. <laughs> yes, good evening, everyone. Um, those are really powerful reflections that just sort of went before me. And I just want to, you know, again, just say thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some reflections, especially as a non-South African. <laughs> um, you know, watching this movie, the key word that really struck me was allyship. And, you know, the heroes of this film are not only African heroes, but they're really global heroes. Um, I spent time reflecting on how some of the themes of this project are relevant to the social challenges the world is actually facing today. Um, in this current Black Lives Matter, you know, political moment, I've been working with a firm called um, Diversio to use artificial intelligence and big data to help companies achieve their diversity and inclusion goals. And a key thing executives and public officers always ask us is, you know, how can we sort of show this authentic allyship to our black colleagues? Um, and this movie really gives everyone a masterclass in allyship. You know, we saw courage, we saw sacrifice um, to knowingly and purposefully reject your position of privilege because you disagree with inequality is one of the most selfless things anybody can do. Um, Fisher and Goldberg um, applying to be actually moved to Robben Island to show their solidarity with their non-white counterparts to me is one of the highest examples of allyship I think I've ever heard of in my life. Um, my thoughts and questions really for our esteemed panel um, today is really how they think allyship should play out um, in this current contemporary uh, society that we have, you know, whether in South Africa or here in the UK or really just across the world. Um, I was struck as well by some of the comments that I was seeing in the chat, you know, saying children should be learning this in school. This is what the education should be, right? Um, but, you know, it's not necessarily a one size fits all answer, but I'm really interested in, you know, the panelists ideas um, beyond school about how the wider public can really gain, you know, awareness um, of and engage with such powerful historical stories at this critical time in the world's, you know, history, where we've just experienced the biggest civil rights movement the world has ever seen with these global Black Lives Matter movements, how can we really jump in this time and really sort of give the world the education that we need? Because so many of these things, unfortunately, have happened in the past. And, you know, if you're, if you're not able to actually reconcile and actually learn some of these things have happened, you know, where are we going? And the fact that, you know, the, the education that we currently have, not just through the, through the education systems, but just what we have in front of us in popular culture and so on, is not necessarily in line with where we want to go um, beyond schools and beyond formal education. Um, I want to, you know, really hear ideas about how the wider world can learn about some of these historical sacrifices that have been made for the world that we you know are, that we have today and of course for the greater future that we all imagine that will hopefully be a more equal world um with a lot more tolerance and inclusion thank you so much thank you so much so the question of allyship has been uh, raised uh, which of the panelists would like to start commenting on that? Um, but I have to tell you, uh, Danola, as a form of encouragement, that um, a, a lady that I respect a lot has just commented and said, phenomenal, Danola, loved your point about allyship, so powerful shit about the greatest act of selflessness, uh, being giving up your position of privilege. High-powered lady who is holding a very high powered position in one of the educational institutions in the United Kingdom. And her name is Aruma Ote. So, um, Sir Nicholas, would you like to start first in terms of commenting on allyship? Well, I've never heard uh, the word allyship before. And um, I think whoever invented it uh, is brilliant. It's a great word and it's a great concept and it embraces really in a word what all these remarkable Rivonia trialists were about, allyship. They came from disparate backgrounds. Cathy Cathrada was a, came from, his father was a shopkeeper in uh, Schweizer Renica. Uh, Rusty Bernstein was a white architect. Dennis Goldberg, uh, an engineer whose parents were communist immigrants. Andrew Malingeni had 12 brothers and sisters. 
and lived in poverty in the township and had to get a job as a caddy to help his mother put food on the table. And all these people, they came from, and Bram Fischer was an elite Afrikaner nationalist family whose father taught, grandfather, the first prime minister of the Orange Free Colony talked about stinking coolies um, and lazy natives. All these people came together and they treated each other with such respect. That I think comes across in the way you see in the film, Dennis and Andrew interacting with each other. Dennis is obviously far more garrulous uh, Andrew much more uh, shy, but uh, nonetheless perfectly happy to take the piss out of Dennis when he says you're a cheeky bastard uh, in um, what he said to the uh, Colonel Oka. I think that um, it, it, it's summed up actually by something that uh, Nelson Mandela said uh, when he um, gave the first Bram Fisher Memorial Lecture in 1994. He said, as an Afrikaner, um, sorry, uh, with that background, Brahm could not but have become an Afrikaner nationalist as we became African nationalists 30 years later as a result of our oppression by whites. Both of us changed. Both of us rejected the notion that our political rights were to be determined by the color of our skins. We embraced each other as comrades, as brothers, to fight for freedom for all in South Africa, to put an end to racism and exploitation. And that when Bram Fischer died, still in, police in prison custody, Bram Fischer should have presided over a memorial service on Robben Island and sent a telegram saying, farewell, great son of Africa. You don't get more allyship than that. And if you contrast that, and Andrew saying we were a multiracial band of comrades fighting for a non-racial society, if you contrast that with the years of corruption and cronyism and turning black against white and white against black in the last period of years before President Ramaphosa came to power. That to me sums up precisely the power of the Mandela uh, message and the Rivonia trialist message, but also how easy it is for that message to get lost by future generations who just don't know those stories. You have to know the stories, you have to know the history, and if you do, and you're a sentient uh, and empathetic human being, of course you respond uh, in the right way. And I think that is absolutely uh, at the heart of it. Uh, and just to add, on the colonization point uh, that was made earlier, I wholly agree about that. Uh, and if you're black, you, you see the, 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 the roads must fall and the, the, the Colson's, the, the statue of the slave owner in Bristol, uh, from the perspective that it is your ancestors that were being oppressed. But if you're a white and you're looking at this, it's very easy to say, oh, well, what's all the fuss about? It was a long time ago. Because what we were not told at school as part of our history was the extent of the brutality and the um, cruelty, not throughout the, the, the British Empire, but as certainly as deployed from time to time. And so our attitude of, is based on our understanding of history, which is actually not a complete understanding of history. And I think one of the things that the Black Lives Matter movement will unleash is a so-called decolonization of history uh, without lowering uh, academic standards, but just actually seeing the history from the side, the point of view, not just of the winners, but of, of the losers. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, Sir Nicholas Dadlin. Uh, Dr. Elino Susulu, would you like to share your thoughts or comment in that regard? Yes, I agree totally with the issue of history. And I think that we really need a renewed effort. Uh, you know, I can name uh, projects here where people have tried to cover. There's a brilliant documentary by a group of young men from Togoza about the violence in the 90s, which nobody wanted to, which people don't really want to talk at, talk about and want to cover, uh, shove under the, the carpet. And I think that they struggled to get funding and they struggled to show their films. So I think the project of actually um, aggregating information and, and making it available as, as what, he, what is actually there 
And I want to emphasize the institutions again. I forgot to mention, I'm glad Leonora Tate Magubane is on the call. And Leonora is on the board or, or has been associated with the Schomburg Library for many, many years. And Schomburg is one of the places where I went to do my research and found information about um, Professor Z.K. Matthews when he spent uh, 1953 uh, in New York. And so there's a lot of very valuable information at these institutions. And I think these documentaries such as this one and the many other struggle documentaries that are there are <clears throat> really important and we need to find ways. I also think the digital space like this one, you know, people are not going to school and there's this struggle and about whether to open schools or not. I'm very happy that I'm not the Minister of Education who has to make a decision mm -hmm. because it's the one decision where you're wrong, whatever you decide. Uh, and, and it's everywhere, it's worldwide. I know people in the US are grappling with this. We are grappling. There's no right answer, but one of the things that can be done at least to mitigate the harm of children not being in schools is to be able to show this, is to be able to have these kind of webinars. Of course, we face the problem of inequality and some people don't, not having access and not having data, but those are all battles that we should fight so that children, wherever they are, are able to have access to the digital space and are able to be part of uh, a screening of a film like this one and mm -hmm. conversation such as this. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. John, do you have any reflections? Let me see. Okay, uh, that is fine. What we can do is to move on to hear the thoughts that uh, Lishoho Nolo, Nolo Piri Rutledge has. Uh, Nolo, over to you. Thank you. It's been so interesting actually just watching this movie. Um, can everybody hear me, Papi? I hope you can hear me. Yes, thank you. Um, because um, I was, I think, part of the generation that had lost hope. Um, mm -hmm. When we look back and um, we go through school, we go through um, university, and it seems as though nothing is happening. Um, I, gave, I was on a panel two years ago where I think I had articulated more frustration than anything at mm -hmm. uh, the current administration, at the pace at which uh, things were going. But um, after watching uh, a film such as this, it sort of takes you back to slow down, uh, especially what, what Babu Mlangeni said in, this, in the sense where he articulated how hard uh, and all the um, sacrifices that they had to do and make to actually get us to where we are. And for us to complain and to say nothing is, is happening going forth is a bit, um, well, let's have a better word, bratty. So, you know, um, but in, um, this, I was going to speak a lot about the allyship that came through in, in the form of Bram Fisher and, and, and his colleagues, because you're seeing it a lot happening now with the Black Lives Matter movement, especially when now cases are coming out of South Africa, from Cricket South Africa, saying that uh, there's so much systemic racism that um, is still so prevalent within the organization. And you do have, although you do, you, you are getting a lot of negative um, commentary from the old players, you are actually getting a lot of allyship and a lot of people standing up with the uh, colors of, uh, sorry, players of color um, to show solidarity in that we, not, we can't all be free and unless the black man is free as well. So that's really, really um, interesting to watch. But it was, it's incredible to read and listen and hear of the generation of our parents that gave so much for us to be where we are. They fought tirelessly and so selfishly for, uh, so, so selflessly to, for us to have the things that we currently have right now. And I think going forward, um, it's all about what we have been uh, empowered to carry on. So it's, uh, it's on us to carry, take the baton and move it forward. And, um, and I think I really appreciate the, 
the title of this documentary because life truly is wonderful. Um, as uh, Goldberg was saying, we are in a world where we are armored. Uh, not, we, not, we may not be armored economically, but we are armored with hope. If you look back, things were not as good as we have it now. Yes, things are not rosy um, currently, but they're not as bad as we had it before. So we are armored with hope. And, um, and just like the apartheid system was so strong and um, it went so deep, so is systemic racism. Mm. But there are um, tools that uh, especially the young people are throwing out there to try to fight the systemic racism that still continues. And this, does, this comes in the form of the decolonial project in education, the one that Masasulu spoke about. Um, I wrote a, big paper, a lot of papers on decolonial uh, decon Oh, decolonized education um, in a sense of uh, especially concentrating on pan-Africanism because I saw somebody ask a question on Robert uh, Sabukwe so I, I concentrated a lot on his teachings and um, uh, in terms of making it an actual African project and including the whole African um, continent in the sense that we start creating our own um, identity instead of it being told by somebody else mm -hmm. and um, also talks on economic reform that are coming uh, as well on a global conversation and that on allyship which i think uh, none of these projects will actually continue if it weren't for allyship as you we saw in the in the film and yeah so the whole pro uh, thing going forward is hope and like um, many of people have said before us you know the struggle continues a luta continua but it is upon us to just continue uh fighting the good fight and keep the fire burning whatever the fire looks like mm -hmm. <laughs> Romela, um, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, I'm, un I'm unmuted now so if i can just have a brief a brief few words um i think we're extraordinarily fortunate to um have with us tonight these four young leaders who have spoken um mm. i think they've been extremely insightful and they show a kind of understanding of the situation which is really quite extraordinary and it's the beginnings i think of a real dialogue that needs to take place an intergenerational dialogue uh, which needs to take place i think colossa spoke about that uh, when i first appeared on a platform with machaba she uh uh, she, she observed that in the run-up to the transition in South Africa in 94, and for a while afterwards, there was actually a great intergenerational and interracial dialogue going on. Mm -hmm. And when we met in Berlin 20 odd years later, um, her question was, what has happened to that dialogue? Why are mm -hmm. we not having that dialogue anymore? And mm -hmm. I think that is an incredibly relevant point which comes out of this. I wonder if we could just very briefly go through the four um, young leaders who have spoken and just for them to give us a very brief idea of what they do now. I know, Danola, you've just come back from an extraordinary experience in China. Colossa is uh, uh, following an extremely interesting masters in Cape Town. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what um, uh, Lechokonolo is doing now and Machaba, but just a minute each. Um, so that we can get a little bit of context for where you're okay. coming from. You want to go um, first, uh, uh, Colossa? Um, hi, everyone. So I'm doing my, this is my second year of my master's. And my master's is entitled Community Development Trust, Brokering Property Relations on Communal Land in Amakwa Land. So when I said that after political freedom, what do you have next? Economic freedom. So for me, these trusts are about how land reform is still the question where this justice is still missing and so for me this question of continuity comes through in my research great much other um so at the moment i'm still working very intently on um finding ways for universities to fund research um especially enabling uh exchanges between not just the us and south africa but south africans going to the united states as well and I'm also in the process of registering, um, well, since COVID, but I am in the process of registering for a PhD at the University of the Witwatersrand as well. Great, Danola. 
Yes, um, my background is in investment banking. Um, so I was at Goldman Sachs up until last year when I got the Schwarzman Scholarship. So I've just completed online <laughs> my master's scholarship in global affairs um, in Beijing in China. And right now, actually just today, I've been offered a job at the UN. <laughs> so I'm probably going to take that. Um, but I was also, I'm working with some other organizations on the side and I run my own organization here in Luton that focuses on the economic empowerment of girls. Great, fantastic, wow. and congratulations on the job. It's Thank moved you. very quickly since we spoke last week. <laughs> I um, know, <laughs> everything can change in one week. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Lekla Kunola, um, what about you now? I am based here in London. I work for the uh, Save the Children International. Um, I am concentrating on the child-led activism in the education and advocacy department. Great. Pumela, over to you. Thank you so much. We have, um, you know, I, I'm, I always say I'm also in the business of connecting people. And so we have an offer here from uh, Madame Aruma Ote, who's the executive in residence at the Said Business School at the University of Oxford. Uh, she says that she's co-leading um, the anti-racism effort uh, sorry, effort at um, Said Business School at the University of, Ex of Oxford. And she says that they have a 60 person task force that will make recommendations to the Dean of the Business School. She would like this uh, enriching film to be shared uh, to the University of um, uh, Oxford and the, and, the, and, the, and the colleagues who are in the task force. And also, uh, she would also like that this film is shared widely with the university. And uh, she's grateful for this opportunity. So we are grateful that, you know, uh, we know for sure that the word is going to spread and that there will be um, an, a bigger audience, particularly if we're talking about a task force, because these are the people that are going to set policies that will guide the future. So grateful, uh, Madam Arun Maote, that something has also come out of uh, the interactions today, which are going to grow the network. And I like to interact with people who make specific commitments on the sport that take us forward. Um, and I hope that in that task force, you'll also include some of these young voices that we have, you know, to bridge that intergenerational gap to ensure that um, we have uh, different lens through which we can be able to view such things. Uh, we've heard words like allyship and unconscious bias. And some of these young people are more learned than all of us. So we can also learn, um, you know, more from what we can call young blood. Right, in, 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 I'm wary of the time and I have gone through all the comments, believe it or not, I am a, I, I am a multitasker. Uh, my other name is Mama Action. I'm able to do different things at once. So I've gone through all the comments. I've shared the two major themes, which was, um, you know, the, the, the willingness for people to help. But one question which I think we can close off with um, is to Sir Nicholas Stadlin, and it says, how do you think we should be celebrating the legacy of Nelson Mandela in this time of coronavirus and the Black Lives Matter campaign? And that question comes from David Kenvin. Can we unmute Sir Nicholas Stadlin? That's for you, Nick. Because of a connection. Um, what I'd say is this, and I think uh, my basic message is one of hope. Uh, one of the most moving uh, screenings and Q&As I did was at the Steve Biko Center in Ginsburg in the Eastern Cape uh, two or three years ago. And uh, there were 200 youngsters, uh, mostly 13 or 14, uh, very neat uh, in their purple uniforms and afterwards these three girls, first of all one girl asked, went up onto the stage and started singing uh, a song, Nelson uh, Mandela Maibuye Africa and then burst into tears, she was so overcome and three other girls came up and they asked for a selfie with me and we had a good chat and after a while
And as though they were doing synchronized swimming, three black female young hands went up. Mm. And I thought, 24 years on from uh, the first free elections in South Africa, the idea that three young black girls in the Eastern Cape from a township could actually assume, not as a fantasy, but as something that was a reality, an aspiration, that one day they might become the president of South Africa. I thought that was hugely encouraging. And two years later, seeing this panoply of uh, talent that you have um, paraded uh, intellectually and morally and uh, within, with, with emotional intelligence mm. of, of these four young uh, uh, people, I think that the future and the hope is in young people. Um, and I think that they are a wonderful advertisement for all the positive things that have happened. Uh, and I think that um, if Nelson Mandela uh, were here today, or Dennis Goldberg were here today, or Walter Sisulu were here today, and they heard these four young people, I think they would take great heart. Mm. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm loving this question that has just come in. Uh, the person would like to remain anonymous, but what they are saying, Nick, write the check. How much do you need uh, for the charity for it to be able to meet its goals? Well, I'll, I'll ask John. John is another trustee, but hundred thousand uh, would go along. And let me quote. Let me quote the question whilst John is thinking. The question says, this is powerful and the message is incredibly important to share with everyone. Well done, Nick, it's extraordinary. And the, and the four young people make me proud. And then it says, oh, the question has jumped now. Um, but it's basically saying, what does the charity need and how much does the charity need for it to meet its goals? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Um, it's a really difficult question because we have great ambitions for the charity um, mm -hmm. in terms of building websites, um, building educational materials, but our immediate goal, which is to distribute this film um, to 6,000 um, schools in South Africa, which has been agreed by the uh, Department of Basic Education. Um, we need to get going on that. We need about 30,000 pounds. Um, to, to achieve our ultimate goals, we're going to need more like 10 times that. Um, but I think 30,000 would get us going in terms of the production and distribution um, of, those, uh, of those films, which we'll do by different, by different means. Some of the schools will need, um, will need um, DVDs, um, others can, 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 can live stream it. Um, but overall, I think that would cover the first stage of the process, and from there we would we would move on to the uh, to the web uh, building the website and the uh, educational materials. Okay, great. I know the person is still online, so they've heard the answer to that question. I I feel that's a, a very good note for us to end. Uh, if you know, with that offer, there are questions around you know, why some, why certain people were not interviewed. And I think that um, Sir Nicholas Stadlin can answer those privately uh, as we are now left with one minute. And in that uh, one minute, I need to thank, firstly, the panelists. Number one, the film maker, you know, Sir Nicholas Stadlin, you have, you know, you have contributed so much into our country and the history of our country. We are truly, truly grateful. I speak now as the country head of the um, of Brand South Africa and the United Kingdom. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the contribution that you have done to our country um, because this will, this will be archived. And um, judging from people's comments today, they want more and more and more young people, in fact, young and old, to hear this message. And the, the, your, your film is also opportune in terms of number one, nation building, uh, 
in South Africa and globally as a whole. Uh, it, you know, this message needs to be shared. Uh, people have talked about the Black Lives um, Matter movement. And this is, a, 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 for me, a humane way of, of, of showing the humaneness of individuals and how if their hearts are in the right place they can really change the world so thank you thank you thank you so much for that at this point i just want Stuart to unmute everyone if you to get to the phone and, and answer so, yeah. Yeah. Well, what happened yeah. this time did you hear her in the first mm -hmm. time? Rank six times oh, thank you. Bye. This is the second time. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Excellent. Yes. Oh, oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salela. Thank you, Salela. Thank you, Pumela. Thank you, Pumela. This is the part of Zoom meeting that becomes good to be South African. I hope you just came alive. Yeah, oh, what an amazing Really? So, please allow me to thank Stuart Round, who is the man behind the dials and who has been making sure that the technical matters have been um, adhered to today and that we've, we've, we've been able to run smoothly. Please also allow me to thank Ndumiso um, Zamini. I feel that without his dedication, without his effort, without his heart, we would not have reached where we have today with this Zoom meeting. But what we're going to do is to share with you the bio of all the, of all the participants via email so that if you're looking for the services of Stuart Round, if you're looking for the services of Ndumiso Zamini, who has greatly made this happen, um, you can be able to contact them directly. And I would also like to acknowledge um, Sharon Constantion, who's the chairperson of the South African Chamber of Commerce in the UK, who has also put um, the chamber's resources into making this a success. In South Africa, we say Izanda Ziagezana, which means each hand washes the other. And in my language, we say, which means that we are not at home as South Africans in the UK. And it is great that we treat each other as sisters, we treat each other as brothers, but more than anything, all of us as global citizens, as global South Africans, as friends of South Africa, that we continue with the sisterhood and we continue with the brotherhood and make sure that together we move South Africa forward and you can make a difference and play a part wherever you are. It's been shared here that there are different ways of contributing to the change that you wish to see. For some it will be monetary as the, as the offers that have been made for funding the charity. For some it will be the gift of your time and for others it will be just spreading and sharing this message. So thank you to all of you and for the commitment that you have made to spread the message about St. Nicholas Stadlin's film, Life is Wonderful, Mandela's Unsung Heroes. Thank you so much.